Good morning, Beach Grove. Oh, it is so good to be back with you guys. I'm hoping that I'll be here for several weeks in a row starting now. How about that? I'm so glad I missed you guys. I, I want to specifically thank Pastor Chad for filling in. I don't know if you saw my email, but I think I texted Chad at 740 on Sunday morning a.m. and said, I can't preach. <laughs> Feels like somebody punched me in the throat. Please, I need you to come. So, uh, can you bring me my Bible, actually? Sorry, I need that. Uh, but I am, I'm so thankful for everybody filling in. I was texting everybody, texting Paul and Steve and trying to get everything, all the ducks in a row. And I'm just really thankful for everybody filling in. And hopefully, we'll be healthy from here on out. He did kind of okay. Kind of okay. We'll take kind of okay with that short notice. Hey, got a couple announcements. Number one, if you are a first-time visitor, there's a green card. It'll take you uh, five and a half seconds to fill out. I encourage you, if you're a first-time visitor or if you've been here two times, you've never done it, please fill out a card. It'll take you no time at all. Um, and then there's a hospitality desk back here. I'm right here in the booth. Paul will be there to, to meet you, shake your hand, and he has a gift for you. So, Paul, our youth um, intern, has a gift for you, so fill out that, and, um, and we want to make contact with you. Got so much to celebrate this morning. Number one, we have launched a new small group this morning, and that is awesome news. That means we're growing, we're not eliminating small groups, but we're adding small groups, and that's led by Kenny Rudd. Um, it's in um, the annex over here, 253B. Um, you, you might not know where that is. That might, might mean nothing to you, but right there is Kenny Rudd. Kenny, can you raise your hand? So if you're looking for a small group, you're missing out if you're not in a small group. And right there is Kenny. There's a brand new one, um, conversational style teaching. Great community is going to be formed there. And so meet Kenny if you have any questions or come talk to me or Pastor Chad, and we can get you plugged into that small group. It's an awesome thing. My small group's having a game night tonight at my house, um, just a time of fellowship. It's going to be awesome. Um, so if you are, um, if you want to come to that, come to that. Five o'clock at my house. Um, okay, also I have three opportunities for you to live on mission um, this week. Number one, Operation Christmas Child. We're starting that up. You can go grab a box. I think there's some boxes out here and upstairs. If you can't find a box, just come talk to somebody. Um, we're going to start filling those out. So Operation Christmas Child, want to put that in front of you. Number two, we're having our fall festival um, in October, and we're starting our candy drive. So buy some candy, bring it here. We're going to have places to donate that. You can talk to Nicole um, over here. There's a place to donate in the right here. So buy your candy, bring it there, as we're going to have tons of people come on our campus. We're going to be sharing the gospel with them. It's an outreach to our community. So that's the second thing you do. Number three, I want to encourage you to invite somebody to come with you to church next week. Uh, I, want to, I want you to consider, do the people in my life know that I go to church? Do the people in my life know that I go to church and it's meaningful to me, that, that I get something out of it? So I want to encourage you to, to live on mission this week just by taking the simple step of saying, hey, why don't you come to church with me on Sunday morning, 1030 at Beach Grove Baptist Church. Finally, as we prepare our hearts for worship, I want to turn us to Isaiah chapter 12. This is the word of God calling us to worship him this morning. It says, you will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel." Oh, we have so much to sing about, so stand and sing with us this morning. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Because shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for sin. 
men, you guys can have a seat. And ushers, you can come forward. As we're going into our time of giving, I wanted to read Mark 12, starting in verse 41. And it says, And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So the question for Jesus here is not how much you are going to give, but instead how you are going to give. We see Jesus loves the sacrificial giver who gives from their heart out of a heart of worship. So as we come to this time, I want you to reflect on, you know, how am I giving? From what heart am I giving? If you're a guest, this, is, this time is not for you. Uh, we want uh, this service to be a gift for you. But if you are a beach grover, um, I, I want to thank you for your faithful and consistent generosity as we come to this time, um, giving from the heart. And also I want to encourage you um, that, you know, we're going to pass the plate here, but also in the bulletin you see a QR code to give online. Super easy to do if you'd rather do that. So let's pray and ask God to bless as we come to give from the heart sacrificially. Father, we come to you so thankful knowing that you have given to us so much more that we could give you. And God, we want to be a faithful church who honors you um, with our finances, God, that we don't serve money. God, we don't put our security in money. God, we don't hope in money, but God, we, we find our security, our hope, and our faith are in you. God, we, we want our treasure to be in heaven. God, we want to be like the poor widow who gives sacrificially, who gives from her heart. God, we want, we want our giving to be um, loved by you. God, we want, we want you to notice our giving and say, truly, this poor person has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. God, we want to, we want to sacrifice to you because you deserve it. So, God, I pray you bless this offering. God, that you can use this offering to, to advance this church's mission, to make disciples. God, that we can, we can worship you in this time, all for your glory. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Should mountains melt into the roaring 
join me in prayer. Jesus, we, we ask you to be king in this place. We, no, we recognize that you are king in this place. You are king over this universe. You are king over this church. And you are king over every single heart. And God, I pray that you will let your kingdom come and your will be done here at this church, at Beach Grove Baptist Church. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, I ask for captivated hearts, that you will captivate us with your majesty and your goodness and your power, your, how, how eternal you are, God, how infinite you are. Jesus, you are the king. You are sovereign. And God, I ask that we can be a submissive church, that this is your church. You are in charge, that we we bow our knee to you. We humble ourselves before you this morning. So often we live in pride. We can be arrogant and haughty, but not this morning, Lord. No, we bow our knee to you, King Jesus. We humbly come before your word because you are so glorious and you have such sovereign authority over our lives. We are not God. You are God, Jesus. We ask for you to reign and be highly exalted in this place. God, I pray that you can make us an evangelistic church and a disciple-making church. God, I pray this week as we go out into our workplaces and our families and our neighborhoods, I pray that you can give us open doors for the gospel to invite people to church, to tell people our testimony, to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. God, will you open those doors for us and God, give us the boldness to walk through those doors. God, I, I want to pray um, for the LCAC right here, so close to us, God, and the great work being done there. God, in helping people who are in need, God, I pray that you can give them all the resources they need. God, I pray for open doors for gospel conversations there. I pray for every volunteer. God, I pray that you can take care of that ministry, that you can that you can build it up for your kingdom and your glory, God. And I thank you that we get to be a small part in that. God, I pray for, I pray for the Zarma people in Niger. This is an unreached people group, five million people. God, and I pray for them that the gospel can come to them. They can realize the bankruptcy of their worldview, and they can realize that the spiritual riches that they are seeking for and the wisdom they are seeking for are found in Jesus Christ alone. God, I pray for this Zarma people that they can understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, that they would live in joyful obedience. God, this group in West Africa, God, I pray that you can set them free from harmful beliefs and practices. And I pray that you'll send the light of the gospel there. God, that you can establish churches in those communities. God, I pray for fruitful ministry here in our town and abroad, all across the world. God, I pray that you can use this church to reach people. God, I pray for fruit. God, I pray that you can you can send and help us reach faithful men who will be able to teach others also. God, I pray that you can raise up leaders. Guys, we come to this time in your word. I pray you can take our hearts, God, and I pray this word will fall on good soil. God, I pray for any backsliding Christians in here who are far from you, God. I pray this word will, will, will fall on good soil this morning and lead them to repentance. I pray for hypocritical um, Christians in here, non-believers in here, God, that this word will 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 make a difference in their life through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for the Christian in this room that we will be fed by your word. I pray for Jeremy who's coming to preach the word to us, that you can fill him with your spirit, guard him from error. But God, I pray as a congregation that we can receive the word joyfully, submissively. God, and I pray that Holy Spirit, you can work on our hearts in a way that only you can do in this time. So God, I thank you for your word. And and we, we come here to receive it now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I mean, I want to introduce to you guys Dr. Jeremy Wallace. Uh, Jeremy's a friend of mine. Uh, He's a great guy. You're going to really love hearing from him. He is the head of Maryville Christian School, um, which is a great ministry. He's a a very important person in our community. He does so much, and uh, he's a great expositor of the word. And so that's what you're going to hear today. I'm really excited. So you guys give a Beach Grove welcome to Dr. Jeremy Wallace. Well, good morning. I've never been called an important person in the community. I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know even know if that's true, but um, yeah, I have been at Maryville Christian for um, 
almost three years now, and I don't know how many of you know this, Maryville Christian was actually started in this church. How many of y'all knew that? How many of you, have, let me ask it the different way, how many of you did not know that? All right, I've educated you all this morning. Um, so yeah, some, about 27 years ago, the school was started with a handful of students in the small group Sunday school classrooms that you have here. And now we're close to 400 students, and uh, the ministry that you all had a part in starting has reached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students and impacted the lives of, of families all across this community. And so many of you didn't even know you had a part in that, but isn't it amazing how God works behind the scenes? Um, and when you, when you are active, involved in ministry, you never know what God is going to do with that. And so um, thank you for your investment, even though many of you may not even know it, thank you for your church's investment into our school. Um, it, it's a joy to be here. I'm thankful for your pastor. I'm thankful for his commitment to God's word. I'm thankful for the work that he's doing here. Um, and listen, if there's ever a time in our world where we need biblical churches that's focused on doing what God has called us to do, it's right now, isn't it? Um, this world's got some uh, uh, crazy things going on. And so that's actually kind of what I want to talk about. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I probably should also mention my wife is over here on the front row, Dana, and my youngest son, Jonathan. I have a 16-year-old who is uh, running sound at the church we normally attend, and so he's not with us this morning. Um. My favorite thing to do is just to preach verse by verse through a passage of scripture. Um, and I'm going to spend about 20 minutes on an introduction, and then we're going to get to a few points that are actually in the bulletin this morning. Because I don't want us to miss the significance of what we see taking place. When we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4, there, there's, there's a lot taking place. And, and really what, Tim, what, what Paul is, is writing to Timothy about is how can he, as a pastor, and how can he and his church impact the community? And really what I want to do is start reading in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And as I'm reading this, what I want you all to do this morning is draw some parallels between what we see Paul saying in our text and what we see taking place in our communities and in the world around us and in our nation. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Continue um, Reading on down, for, verse 6, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupt in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far. For their folly will be, a, will be plain to all as was that of those two men. Jump ahead now, if you will, to chapter 4 and notice verse 3. All right? Chapter 4, notice verse 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, in those nine verses that we read in chapter 3 and those two verses we read in chapter 4, do you see some parallels with what we see happening in the nation and in the world around us? I mean, we could go, I could pause at each one of those descriptors in chapter 3 and give you an example in culture and in society of ways that we see this being lived out in our world today. And it's one thing, I think, for us to step back and say, yes, this is exactly what's happening. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, how is the church to respond? I mean, it's one thing to step back and say, yes, we see this taking place. But how are we as Christians to interact in a world where this is the reality? When we go down through this and we see all around us people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive. I mean, we could go through the whole list. 
I mean, yes, we acknowledge this is the reality in which we are now living. The greater question is, if God has us here, God has you here, God has this church here, how should we live in the midst of this kind of situation? How should we live in the midst of this kind of culture, in this kind of society? What are the beliefs that bolster our testimony? And what are the beliefs that spur our testimony forward and allow us to have the impact that God has called us to have? Well, I think a lot of times it is easy for us to step back and point fingers and shout at the darkness instead of being the salt and the light that God has called us to be in the midst of the darkness. My, my, my concern this morning is not as much on the society and on the culture as much as it is on the church's response to that culture. And let me state it very clearly this morning. I believe God has called Christians and God has called the church to make a difference. God has not called Christians and God has not called the church to simply set back in the shadows and fail to interact and fail to speak and fail to have an impact. God has called the church, and I believe that God has called this church to more than that. God, God has called all biblical churches across our country to not just to sit back and observe what is happening and not just to sit back and acknowledge what is happening, but God has called Christians to have a voice and to stand up and to make a difference. The question is, how do we do that? I mean, how can we live in such a way, and this is a question that we all should be willing to answer, how can we live in such a way where we're, we are not content to shrink back in the shadow of a sinful society, content, content to go through the mere motions of Christianity, content to simply walk through a Sunday schedule? How can we be in a position where we are willing to do what God has called us to do and be what God has called us to be? The only way that this is possible is if the church has the correct foundation. The only way it is possible is for your life and your marriage and your family to have the correct foundation. If a church is going to make a difference and if a church desires to make a difference and the church is going to impact its community, it must have the correct foundation or else we'll be like the man who built his house on the sand. And what happened? It fell. It fell. So what is the foundation? That's the question, right? What is the foundation that we are to have? What is the beliefs necessary for us to be what God has called us to be and do what God has called us to do? Not just as individuals and not just as a family, but as a corporate group of believers, as a church. Now I'm going to state this in a sentence and then I'm going to back up and we're going to unpack it a little bit. How can a church make a difference? The church responds by holding to its belief in scripture. Now, I, I realize that may not have been the answer that you were expecting, but it is, it is exactly what Paul highlights in our text. The church responds. All, all that we read in chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 9, and in chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4, all those descriptors, the way the church responds is by having the co correct foundation of Scripture. What you're going to see is in those verses we read in chapter 3, those first nine verses, what Paul immediately transitioned into in verse 10 is about the focus on Scripture. And we're familiar with verse 15 and 16, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But I do want you to notice, backing up a little bit to verse 14. So he's just described culture. He's just described society. He's just described everything that is taking place. And in verse 14, he says, but as for you, All right, here's how you respond. Here's what you do. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with what? The sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here's, here's what's interesting to me. When he looks and sees everything that's taking place in the world around us and the sinfulness of culture and the sinfulness of society, here's his response. Remember the truth of Scripture. Remember the authority of Scripture. When everything around us is falling apart and we look on... Y'all watch the news? Don't. I'm, I mean, I'm not really saying don't, but... If you watch it, understand there's all kinds of craziness that you're going to be presented with. 
And when you see all that's happening, and then you even pay attention and you start seeing what's being passed down on all kinds of social issues. And the, the redefining of marriage. And the redefining of gender. And what's allowed and what's publicly and socially acceptable and what's not socially acceptable. And we could go on for the next two or three hours this morning just highlighting everything that is taking place, really summarizing what Paul said in the first nine verses of chapter three. And then we start looking inside the realm of Christianity, the umbrella of Christianity. And then we start seeing that the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, will accumulate for themselves teachers. So this, the issues that we see around us is not just in culture. What Paul is also saying is the issues that we see taking place is in part due to so-called Christians who don't have the right foundation. I mean, if we really believe that God has given us a mission and God has given us a purpose and God has call, given us a calling on our lives and a calling for our church to impact our communities, advance the gospel and see lives transformed by the gospel and see marriages transformed and addictions broken and we really believe that God has called us to not just exist in a community but to be a light in that community, then the foundation has to be accurate. And what Paul is saying is the way, the, the most ground level foundation that we can possibly have, the most necessary thing that we need is an understanding of the role of scripture not just in the life of the church but in the life of the believer hold to continue stand firm in what you have learned and what you have firmly believed the response to a culture that rejects scripture is not to focus less on scripture but to focus more on the truth of scripture. The response to a professing believer who wants to water down God's word is not to minimize the truth of scripture, but to highlight the truth of scripture. Why? Why? I mean, why is the, the response to a fallen culture and the response to a shallow Christianity a greater focus on the authority of Scripture? Why, why is that what Paul highlights here? I mean, out of all the things he could have talked about, why is this what he mentions? Oftentimes we look at chapter 3, verse 16, and we pull that one verse out. But I want, I want us to understand that context in which it exists. The last days... And then here's what he says in verse 16. You all know this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There's four things that Paul stresses in these verses that I think explain why the foundation of the church and the foundation of the Christian life must be on the truth of God's word. The first thing, and you see this in your bulletin, is the truth that we know, we've heard it. It's the inspiration of scripture. You see at the beginning of verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Understand something this morning. This is more than a line in a doctrinal statement. This is more than a statement on a website. This is more than a line in a constitution and bylaws. This is the foundation of the Christian life. And there have been people throughout the centuries who believe so strongly in what this is that they were willing not just to proclaim it and not just to live by it, but they were willing to die for it. They believe so strongly in the inspiration of Scripture that they were willing to give their lives so that other people could have it. One such man was William Tyndale. Not too long ago, I read a small biography on the life of William Tyndale. As Tyndale looked at, at England, he knew that they, they needed a Bible in English. And at this time, the they didn't have a Bible in the English language in England, and he made it his life's goal to translate a Bible into English so that every person, so that every household, so that every individual could have access to God's word. And he knew he needed the king's blessing, and so he went to the king and he, ple he pleaded with the king to have the king's blessing, and the king said, absolutely not. He moved forward with it anyway. Anyway. 
At the age of 30, he moved to a remote location to begin working on his translation of the Bible into English. His translation work, what he was doing, was considered to be completely illegal. In fact, in order to pursue this, and in order to accomplish this, he lived in exile for the remainder of his life. And as he would get portions of Scripture done, he actually moved overseas. As he would get portions of Scripture done, he would ship it back in, in bales of cotton. And then he had people who would receive this, and they would get these bales of cotton. They would get these copies or these pages or these little books of par partial portions of Scripture out of that, and they would distribute it until the authorities realized what was happening. In fact, they passed a law that the distribution of Scripture or even the purchase of a Bible was, was a severe criminal offense. The king and his rulers sent agents to search for Tyndale. He spent the next 12 years on the run. After 12 years, he is eventually arrested. He's put in a cold, dark dungeon for 500 days. Imagine that. No windows. Dark, cold, damp, with nothing to eat but bread and broth a little bit every few days. After the 500 days, they bring him out and they put him on trial. And he is sentenced to death. And so they take him out on the day of his execution. And they hang him from a cross and they set him on fire with gunpowder. And in that moment, as William Tyndale is being burned alive, being hung from a cross, his final words, his, his final prayer is this, God, would you open the king of England's eyes? Within two years of his death, the king ordered that every church in England have a copy of God's word in English for public reading. You say, why does that matter? See, as Tyndale looked around at everything that was happening in the culture and the society of that day, he realized the hope for the church and the hope for the Christian to have an impact and the hope for people to be able to live out their faith was directly tied to their access to God's word. And not, not just an access to God's word, but again, he believed so strongly in what scripture was, and he believed so strongly in the inspiration of scripture that this is God breathed, that this is from him, that it didn't matter what it cost, he was willing to sacrifice every, everything, living in exile for years, being thrown in prison, being burned alive just so people could have access to the words on these pages because he believed this is inspired by God. And again, this was more than a doctrinal statement. This was more than just a bullet point. This was more than just something that we intellectually or theologically knew. This was something they clung to with everything. Let me ask you something. When is the last time you looked at the pages of Scripture and were so impacted by what it is that you were willing to sacrifice anything so that other people could have this? His belief that this was God-breathed, was the fuel of his life. And it has been for so many people throughout history. And it's not just that we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. When you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, that naturally leads to our second truth this morning, a belief in the sufficiency of Scripture. Again, look at it. Verse 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. That's the inspiration. Here's the sufficiency, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God may complete, be, be complete equipped for every good work. A true belief in the inspiration of Scripture always leads to a belief in the sufficiency of Scripture. God's Word is sufficient. It's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, for training. It's, it's the Word of God that equips us. So you say, how... Why is it necessary that we have God's word as the foundation of our lives? Why is that necessary for us to have an impact in our community? Because that is the foundation. It is what equips us to do what God has called us to do. You will never, 
You will never impact your neighborhood and impact your community while at the exact same time ignoring Scripture. It will not happen. And a church that believes in the sufficiency of Scripture will not shy away from tough issues because it believes that Scripture is able to address those issues. And so as issues arise this next year, as they will, I mean, we're getting ready to go into, is it okay to mention the word politics? Three of you said yes, the rest of you are like, I don't know. I mean, we're getting ready to go into a crazy election cycle and all kinds of local things taking place. Listen, issues are going to arise. Can I tell you something? The Bible is sufficient to address those issues. And we're going to see all kinds of issues and, and courts and rulers are going to try to redefine things that the Bible has already defined. Can I just tell you this morning that the Bible is sufficient to address those issues? But can I also challenge you that the only way the Christian and the only way the church is going to be able to address those issues biblically if it has its focus on the truth of Scripture. When Scripture is not in clear view, then we are not in a position to make a difference. When it comes to evangelism, we, re we root our evangelism in the message of Scripture. We root our evangelism in the message of the gospel because we believe it is sufficient. So, again, if this is God-breathed, if this really is the word of God, it is infallible, it is inerrant, it is from God, then we also have to believe that it then is sufficient. So no matter what arises in your life and no matter what arises in our culture and no matter what arises in our society, Scripture is enough. It is enough. In a, in, a, in a religious world where it is tempting to maybe to minimize Scripture and kind of water it down so that we can be more attractional and attract more people, can I suggest to you this morning that the primary strategy for growing a church is to focus more on Scripture and to make this the foundation? Ministries are wonderful and the church should have those, but those ministries are never a substitute for the authority of God's Word. So then, if we believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, that leads very clearly then to a third truth, and we have to believe in the centrality of Scripture. Look at the very next verse, chapter 4, verse 1. So again, don't, don't lose sight of the context. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 9, here's what's happening in culture. How do we respond Verse 10 through verse 17, focus more on Scripture. Now he's going to give Timothy a very specific and a very direct instruction. All right, so this is, he's the pastor. Here, here's, here's his job now. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Here's what he's saying. Make here, here's what he's saying to the church. Make God's word central to everything you do. Make God's word the foundation. Make it the centerpiece. Make it the focal point. Make it the strategy. Make it what, whatever term you want to use. Make God's word at the center of everything. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The overarching command that Paul gives Timothy and Paul gives to this church, the primary thing that the church was to focus on was to be centered on the truth of Scripture. Make it the center of your ministry when it's easy and make it the center of your ministry when it's not. Make it the center of your ministry when it's popular. Make it the center of your ministry when it's not popular. Make it the center of your ministry when it is accepted and make it the center of your ministry when culture rejects it. Believe so strongly in what God's word is that it is the foundation of your life and it is the center of your home and it is the focus of your church and it is the heart of your marriage and it is the driving force in your parenting. See, here's what I think happens. Can I be honest with you for a minute? Not that I haven't already been being honest with you, but here's what happens. Christians are very quick 
to acknowledge the importance of the inspiration of Scripture, but very slow to live by the centrality of Scripture. And can I, can I just suggest that if we are unwilling to live with the Bible as the center of our lives, then maybe we really don't believe in the sufficiency of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture as much as we claim to. They're connected. I mean, if this is inspired by God and it is sufficient, then it must be central. And the only reason why it would not be central in our lives and the only reason why it would not be central in our church is because maybe we really do not believe it is sufficient. It is easy to sit in here on Sunday morning and say, yes, the Bible is sufficient. But let me tell you something. It is sufficient for where you work and in your communities. See, we must have a deep-rooted conviction that this book is the very Word of God. It is god Breathed. This is more than lip service. I think another truth that kind of flows from this is I also think, and again, I'm just going to be honest with you, I think it is very tempting to come in and say, you know what, I want my church to believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and I want my church to believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, and I want my church to believe in the centrality of Scripture. But can I remind you this morning that you are the church? And the only way for a church to live out a belief in the centrality of Scripture is for you as an individual to cling to the centrality of Scripture. Your church as a whole will never truly believe and live out and practice the centrality of Scripture until it becomes a passion for you and your life and your family. It's personal. This is, this is not just a corporate truth. This is an individual truth. I want to mention this last truth that's listed, the, the effectiveness of Scripture. We already read verse 3 and verse 4 that talks about kind of the watering down and the minimizing of truth. But then when you look at verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You kind of go through this, you say, what, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, it is the focus on Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, the centrality of Scripture that allows us to be sober-minded and prepared for battle. It is our, our rootedness in Scripture that allows us to, the next phrase, endure suffering, to be ready for the hardship that comes. Listen, when you take a stand on the truth of God's Word, there is going to be opposition and even maybe persecution. And it is our belief in what Scripture is that allows us to endure that suffering. It allows us to be equipped to do the work of an evangelist. It, it is the foundation, it is the baseless basis for evangelism. Listen, we, we heard that prayed about a little bit earlier about the gospel advancing in our community and the gospel advancing in West Africa. Listen, the, the, way, that we, the, the way that we see that take place is through a commitment to Scripture. The way we are faithful in ministry and all of us to fulfill the ministry that God has given us in this place is by believing in what we just talked about, the inspiration, the sufficiency, the centrality, and then ultimately the effectiveness of Scripture. How can this church or any church fulfill the ministry that God has given it through what it believes about Scripture? And again... This is not just any other book. This is the very word of God. And if you truly, listen, I, I believe this with all my heart. If you truly believe what we just read, that this is God breathed, that this is inspired, then you also have to believe that it is sufficient. For every challenge. And if you believe that it is sufficient for every challenge, then it must be central to everything we do. Parents, how central is God's word in your parenting? 
husbands and wife? How central is God's word in your marriage? Those of you who are retired, how central is God's word in your retirement? Those of you who teach a class or lead a ministry, how central is God's word in your ministry? And then corporately with us all together, how central is God's word in your mind when it comes to how you view the ministry that God has given your church? A number of years ago, I read a book called The Insanity of God. I know the title seems a little strange, but the the focus of the book was all about how God works in ways that we would not expect. I mean, if we were going to write down a script for God to follow in order to see some great ministry happen, God doesn't typically follow the script that we would write out. And in this book, this, this author traveled around to places around the world where the church was flourishing and people were being saved and lives were being transformed by the reality and the truth of the gospel in the midst of persecution, in the midst of many times torture and even execution. And the whole focus of this book, and I think Lifeway even produced a, a, uh, a video on this that you can watch online. I would encourage you to do so. It's really good. But as he was walking through this, he would go from place to place all around the world. And he spent several months traveling, and he was just documenting, why is the church growing here? There's persecutions. Christians are being executed. Or why is the church growing here? It's illegal to have a church. And then he would write about his observations and what he saw. One place that he traveled to was the, at the time the USSR. And as he would go to these different locations, he would meet up with a guide, a Christian, who would take him into these places and kind of give him the backdrop and the story of, of what was happening in these locations. And this guide and this trip took him into this little village and they went in to this house they knocked on this little hut and he walked in and they sat him down at a little table in the middle of a room and the family came in and the husband said that this is where it happened he was like where, where what happened and so he backed up and kind of told him the whole story this this husband this father said well there's not a church in our village and so I began praying about just leading my family in devotions. And so we would come into this room and we would sit and said, I don't have any biblical training. I don't have any biblical knowledge. I, I just knew that this was the Bible and this is what God had given us. And so I would read a portion of scripture and I would try to explain it. And we just did that. And, and before you know it, a few other people wanted to come and join. And so we'd read a little bit of scripture and try to talk about what it meant and how we could put it into practice. And he said, I, I remember a few songs that I had learned back earlier in my life. And so we had sing a few of those songs together. And the village was, was small and the, the huts were close. And so as they began doing this, more and more people heard. And before you knew it, it wasn't just the four or five that were there. It was 15, 20, 25, 40, 60. Before long, it with so many people that they had to stand outside and they would open the windows just so they could hear this husband and this father read from scripture and talk about it. One day in one of these gatherings as they were meeting the front door got kicked in and authorities from the surrounding area came in and they threatened him and said listen if you continue this you will be arrested. And they left and they continued. They continued meeting and again this wasn't a in their mind, it wasn't a church, and in fact, when they talked to this pastor about doing they said, listen, I am not a pastor, I am just a Christian who wants to read God's word and know God's word, and if other people want to come and listen, that's fine, I am, I am not a church leader, I am not an elder, I'm not any of those things. And as he continued, there were 75, 80, 85 people crammed in, the round, in and around this hut. And then the day it happened, they kicked in the front door. They beat him, and they took him to prison, 1,500 miles away from where he was, with 1,500 other of the worst criminals in that country. And they threw him in this cell, and 
he had no idea what to do, and his wife and his kids were back home alone, and he did I mean, you can imagine the turmoil that he is going through in this moment. He said, I, I didn't know what to do. All I knew is I had, I, I knew some of God's word, and so what he would do is every morning he would stand up, and he would go to the door of his jail cell, and he would hold out his arms, and he would sing what he called his heart song to God. And early on, the other 1,500 criminals, they would see him doing this and they would yell at him and curse at him and throw all kinds of things at him. You can use your imagination of the types of things that they would throw at him in this prison. And as he would go around, he would find little scraps of paper and little pieces of charcoal. And he would get on that little piece of paper and he would write down as small as he could, as much of scripture as he could, and as many Bible verses as he could. And if he didn't know the exact Bible verse, he would write down the Bible story and the, the walls were wet. And he would get this little piece of paper and he'd stick it up on the, the wall of his jail cell. And he would make that his offering to God each day. And the guards, they would come in and they would see it and they would take it down and they would get their batons and they would beat him. They would kick him. So some days within inches of his life, broken ribs, broken bone, broken jaw, and this was his life every single day, but still every morning he would get up and he would sing his heart song to God that was filled with truth from scripture. And they would lead him out and they would have time out in the yard and he would find a little piece of paper and a piece of chalk and he would fill it again, both sides, with as much scripture as he could. He knew scripture had to sustain him. And he would again go back. And every time they saw it, they would take it down and they would beat him. And it got to the place where they were threatening him. Listen, you have to stop this. They had a female prisoner that they dressed in some of his wife's clothes. And they hid her face and drug him by his drug her by his cell and executed her in the cell next door, him thinking that his wife had just been put to death. And they came in, they said, now will you recant of your belief in who God is and belief in scripture? And he was at a place where he was about ready to throw in the towel. I mean, you can imagine. And according to him, he had a dream that night, right before he was ready to sign and recant everything. And they'd promised to release him. And according to what he says, he had a, a dream that evening where God reaffirmed. He woke up bolstered in his faith. And he said he got up that morning and went to the door of his jail cell and held out his arms and sang his heart song as loud as he ever did. And the, the guards came in. They said, okay, today you die. And so the guards come in and they get him and they're getting ready to take him out to the middle of the yard where they are going to execute him and something incredible happened. When this was taking place, he had now been in prison for 17 years. And so as they are dragging him out of his jail cell to take him to his place of execution, something incredible happened. The 1,500 other prisoners who had been in there all stood up to the door of their jail cell and all in unison began, began singing that heart song to God. And the guards stop and the main guard comes in and say, Who are you? And he said, I am a son of the living God and his name is Jesus. Within a few days, they ended up releasing him. And he went back and found his wife alive and healthy and his kids healthy. And they talked with him and they said, what is it that allowed you to endure the pain of being in prison for 17 years and weekly torture and abuse? What, thinking your wife was executed in front of you, what allowed you to endure all of that? You know what his answer was? <coughs> Scripture. scripture. C can I suggest to us this morning that what is going to enable us, enable you, enable this church to not just exist in the midst of a fallen culture, but to live and operate in a way that impacts the fallen culture is completely tied to what you believe about God's word. 
And yes, it's not going to be popular, and yes, you may be ridiculed, and there may be opposition, and there may actually be persecution, but I believe what is necessary is for Christians to stand and to boldly say, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. It is from God, and I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. It has the answer for every challenge we face, and because it is sufficient, I believe in making it central to everything we do in my life, in my family, and in my church, and because of that, I will trust in it, and I will rely upon it, and I will know it, and I will study it, and I will sing it, and I will pray it, and I will celebrate it, but God's Word will be at the heart of everything I do and as a church for this church to continue to grow and have the impact that God has designed it is only going to happen when you as a congregation come together and say God's word is enough let's make it the focal point of everything we do every single week every single ministry every single activity let's run everything through the pages of scripture it is the authority it is enough See, my challenge to you this morning is very simple. Listen, I I don't care over the past several years what you have claimed to believe about Scripture. What I do care very much about is that we all live as though the Bible is central to everything. And that's only going to happen when we view this correctly. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close. I'm going to leave this in a word of prayer. And where you are, I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And wherever you are with your belief about Scripture or your practice with Scripture, I want you to take just a minute as I pray and you just do business with God and commit your life and your ministry in this church to be built on the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. And God, our nation and our world is messed up. And there's so many different ideas about what needs to happen. But God, we understand this morning that the greatest need in our country and our world is not a political solution. It's not an economic solution. It's not a social solution. The greatest need in our world is the need for people to know Jesus. And the only way for our churches and this church to have the impact that you have called us to have is when we view your word correctly. God, it is inspired, it is sufficient, and God, I pray that we would make it central to everything. And if there's anyone here this morning who has not been building aspects of their lives on the truth and the authority of your word, I pray that you would convict their hearts this morning. And as a result of our time together this morning, may our light shine bright. And may people know you and hear of you and worship you because we build our lives and we build our ministries on the truth of Scripture. We give you all the honor and all the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let me just say thank you. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here this morning and to worship with you and to sing with you and to celebrate all that God's doing. I promise I make to you all this morning is I will be praying for you. I'll be praying for this church, and if there's ever anything I can do to help, encourage, support, assist, please let me know. Thank you all so much. Let's stand and sing a chorus, leaning on the everlasting arms as we go out this morning. (laughs) 